Welcome to Study with the Vets, the magazine show about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's episode, we'll feature retired Secretary of State General Colin L. Powell, listen to how a deaf student functions in a hearing world at Hunter College, and take a ride into a skateboard shop in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. This past May, the Colin L. Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership was inaugurated at City College. General Powell was actually there for the ceremony and set aside a few minutes to talk to our very own Andrew Falzone. Since graduating from the City College of New York in 1958, Colin Powell has become one of the most prominent military and diplomatic leaders of our time. Powell has maintained close ties with the CUNY community and recently returned to City College to inaugurate the Colin L. Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership. For Powell, it was a homecoming of sorts, returning to the place that put him on a path to become the only person in our nation's history to serve as its highest ranking diplomatic officer and highest ranking military official. In the Army, they teach you, you know, no matter how cold everybody may be, you're the leader, you're never cold. Troops may be hungry, you're never hungry, you're the leader. They may be tired, you're never tired. Yeah. Uh, and you're so that you, even you, you've got to be, you've got to be uh, optimistic that mm -hmm. things will get better. And I think the, our youngsters don't get enough of that. And that may be why retired General Colin Powell has maintained such close ties with City College. As a kid growing up in the Bronx, Powell was unsure of the direction his life would take, but that all changed in 1954. That's when Powell began working on his geology degree at City College of New York and stumbled upon what became his life's calling. You said that when you came here to City College, uh, ROTC was something you connected with for the yep. first time in your life. You really found yourself. Mm -hmm. What was it about ROTC that you did connect with? Well, I was, I was a little over 17 years old when I tripped over ROTC in the summer of uh, 1954. And it was the structure, it was the discipline, it was the guys. You know, when, you, when you're 17 or so and you're leaving home really for the first time, uh, you're kind of adrift. And I found a new home, I found a new family. Uh, with my fellow students here in the ROTC. After graduating from the City College in 1958, Powell served two tours in Vietnam. Upon his return, he was chosen to serve as a White House fellow with the Nixon administration. In 1987, he would become National Security Advisor to President Reagan, and in 1989, he became a four-star general under President George H.W. Bush, and later that year was nominated to be Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. At 52 years old, he became the youngest Joint Chiefs Chair. He was also the first chairman to come out of ROTC. In 2001, Powell was again called to serve his country, but this time the general would leave his military uniform at home and serve as Secretary of State to George W. Bush. As a soldier transitioning into diplomacy, um, was it harder for you to, to not be the Army General, the orders get done? No, not, not particularly because I had been National Security Advisor for two years to President Reagan, so I kind of understood the civilian side of, of government. Uh, and when I walked into the State Department, uh, somebody said, well, what do we call you, General or Mr. Secretary? I said, Mr. Secretary, I'm Secretary of State. In 1989, Parade Magazine had published your 13 Rules of Leadership. For CUNY students and alumni, what guidelines would you give them today? The reporter who wrote that article asked me to look at some little sayings I had under my desk glass that he had heard about and just read off some of them. And I read off the first 13. Number one says, you know, it isn't as bad as you think. It'll be better in the morning. And the 13th rule is, is a, a derivative from a military saying, and that is that always think things are going to get better, no matter how bad things may seem at the moment. And I think that's an attitude for young people. They, they face difficulties in school, they face other difficulties in life, and it starts to get them down. And so, no man, never be down, always be up. While Powell's military career influenced his tenure as Secretary of State, he already had experience with international relations as a kid growing up in the South Bronx. When you were uh, a young man growing up in the city, my understanding is you worked in a baby furniture store yep. and you picked up some Yiddish sayings. Yeah, okay. Did any of those translate, you know, did you get any wisdom or guidance from yeah, those? Yeah, whenever, whenever I was kind of annoyed with somebody, I've got Gesundheit Keppel, you know, I'll hit you in the side of the head or you're uh -huh. a blessing, and you, depending on how you say it, it's either a blessing or a slap in the side of the head. I preferred it as a slap in the side of the head. The biggest lesson I got from my experience in the toy store was from the Russian immigrant Jew who owned it, uh, Jay Sixer. And after I'd worked there for a few summers and a few Christmas seasons, he, he pulled me aside and he said to me, Kali, you're, you're a good worker. I love having you in the store. You're part of the family. But listen, you know, you can't ever stay here. 
you have to get your education. If you've got a good family and you're smart, go get your education and make sure you move on. And so I never had any intention of staying in that toy store, but I was so touched that he thought enough of me to tell me that I had the potential to do other things in life and don't think that I should stay there. Through the years, Powell has remained committed to his collegiate alma mater. In 1997, he founded the Colin Powell Center for Leadership and Service. The center is being transformed into the Colin L. Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership, a degree-granting school that encompasses City College's social science departments. Professor Vincent Brudreau is the center's director and assisting as it transitions into a full-fledged school. We work with him to develop programs that do for City College students today what City College did for him uh, uh, when he was a student here. It's never been a question. He's always said, make the school, make the center a, a, a program that emphasizes leadership and success in our students. Powell became known for his hands-on approach while running the State Department. He plans on bringing that same approach to City College. I'll be spending uh, a lot of time up here at City. We used to have just a center to worry about, and now we have a much larger school to worry about and five academic departments I want to get to know and visit, and so I'm spending a lot more time at that City. We're able to bring in uh, you know, people like James Baker, Barbara Walters, uh, Jamie Dimon, um, to come and speak to the students because General Powell Wherever he goes and whoever he meets says, you've got to get up to City College. You've got to meet these students. You've got to talk to these students. One of those big names drawn to City College is Tom Brokaw, who was a member of the board of directors for the Powell Center. Brokaw spent 22 years as anchor and managing editor of the NBC Nightly News. He now hosts a mini-series on the military channel called The Brokaw Files. Everybody that we knew in our age group had probably served in the war in some capacity. There are our coaches and teachers and the businessmen up and down Main Street and so on. And he really then becomes a continuation of the greatest generation. And somebody who is one of the most highly regarded Americans uh, of our time. You're as much a historian as you are a journalist. What will history say about Colin Powell? Well, history would say that Colin Powell was in the front ranks of the first full opportunity that African Americans had to serve in any capacity in this country. We now have had a, an African American president, but we had not had an African American chairman of the Joint Chiefs or a Secretary of State. Those were huge breakthroughs. Powell has also been granted a distinguished professorship at City College. As the Colin Powell School prepares for its inaugural semester, it will incorporate some of the same lessons that Colin Powell himself learned as a young New Yorker 50 years ago. What I learned in New York, uh, in, in the multi-ethnic neighborhood I grew up in, everybody was from somewhere else. Uh, everybody had about the same level of income in the family. So we were all kind of equals, and we had to get along, and we had diverse backgrounds. And I think I learned from that how to sort of respect uh, what diversity is and respect others. Wow, look at him go. Whoa. He must be heading to Brooklyn's KCDC. Hi, my name is Amy Gunther, and I own KCDC Skate Shop in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. The skateboard demographic is different everywhere, but for KCDC, like our demographic is mainly, you know, males in their or, you know late teens to late twenties. Um, let's take a look at the skateboards. We tend to be very heavy on local brands. We like to support local companies as much as possible. This graphic has been around for a long time, but it's really, really popular because it's pretty awesome. She's on a skateboard. <laughs> Born and raised on Long Island, Amy's life-changing moment came when she was 14, skateboarding in New York City. One fateful day, I was in Washington Square Park and I was scouted by a modeling agency. I started modeling when I was 14 years old. I would go to Europe. Even in Paris, I was able to meet other skateboarders that kind of like took me in and 
Now I'm a spokesperson for We SC. It's a, a Swedish clothing brand. And as if modeling in all the fashion capitals of the world weren't enough, in 2001, Amy opened KCDC. What else could she possibly squeeze into her schedule? Ah. I attend Brooklyn College. Uh, I'm in the undergrad program. My majors are business management and finance, and I double in marketing. I think even a couple days into my first semester there, I was already, my like mind was thinking about how I could apply what I was learning to my business. It just motivated me to, to figure it out. Skate night was something that was a concept we came up with. It's a little difficult to skateboard during the winter months. And we wanted to kind of create a community atmosphere so that people could come and just like be with their friends and skateboard inside and just kind of stay motivated throughout the winter. And there's also a charitable component to skate night. We did art shows through each event. Some of them, the art was auctioned for certain um, like nonprofit organizations. Like the prints that were sold, all the proceeds went to the Andy Kessler Foundation, a foundation that was put together by myself and some people when a friend of ours passed away who was like very pivotal in the skate community. So it just um, kind of supports youth that are interested in skateboarding and surfing and art and stuff like that. the community is definitely larger than being a merchant. Sometimes my heart is bigger than my brain <laughs> and uh, we, we do a lot of things that not, don't necessarily make us money. We're still alive and kicking after 12 years so we must be doing something right. Barry Mitchell, study with the best. What's the relationship between a deaf person and her interpreters? Well, we visit a student at Hunter College to find out. He wrote a lot, and we're just going to summarize a couple of the sort of main ideas that he talked about. Um, the medium of the, uh, is the message thing is a really important part of what he's talking about, right? So the, this idea is that the actual structure of the media when I was 16 months old, my mother found out that I was deaf, and so they, they pretty much believed that I was born deaf. I, I, I identify as nothing other than uh, as a deaf person, and it, and it doesn't bother me. And I'm actually very proud to be, to be deaf, and you know, God gave, me, gave this to me so that I could experience this way of life. My name is Karen, and um, in ASL, that's how you sign my name, Karen. When I was three, I learned something called um, SEE, -E, which is Signed Exact English, which is basically um, spoken English um, on the hands. And then when I was around 15 or 16 is when I learned ASL. I got more exposure to deaf people. I had a lot of deaf friends, and so I, I really picked up ASL quickly. And uh, ASL, it's just, it's more succinct. And uh, there's a lot more, there's, you know, facial expressions, it's just, it's just um, better and um, more fluid language. But when I'm in school and the teacher says something or a student says something, then the interpreter will interpret that so that I can understand what everybody else is talking about. And I can also voice for myself, but you know, sometimes people can't understand, so the interpreter will, uh, will voice what I'm saying. Um, the unfolding of global events, yeah. Also, I noticed that in the past, in the way that we would get our news would be from newspapers. It would come maybe once per day or once per week, depending upon what kind of newspaper. But now we can get it instantly on, on our, uh, our mobile devices. The news is, is constantly refreshing itself. Right. And we also get our news, like, I know people who I think interpreters, we have a very interesting place in the deaf community because we truly have to straddle both the hearing and the deaf worlds. We're an essential part of the community, but it's important for us not to 
believe that we are the most important part of the community. There's some, some of us who are very, very involved in the community, and there's some interpreters where interpreting is just a job, and that's where they draw the line with the deaf community. I'm just there to um, facilitate communication. I'm not there to make decisions for anybody. I'm there to um, kind of meld two cultures together. The interpreters, you know, seem to be able to understand me as a deaf person, and and I can understand the interpreters as well. So we we're really, you know, using the same language. A lot of people in the deaf community are very close with each other because we share the same language, which is ASL. Um, we share a lot of the same culture. Deaf people, we get together for events like the ASL Slam. I've been to a lot of different deaf events, but this is my first time going to the Slam. I, I'm really looking forward to it because I'm always interested to see, you know, how other people, you know, um, do the poetry and also to, you know, meet new people and, and to make connections. ASL, it just, it fits my, my culture and, and, and my language better. My parents have always taught me to be proud of who I am, no matter what, and to always, you know, to go for what I want in my life. And now, you know, I'm trying to show the world that yes, I'm deaf, um, but I can do whatever I want and there's no need for people to judge me. And, you know, I can do anything that I want. You know, I, I work hard. Um, being deaf is not, it's not a factor. I, I work hard to accomplish what I want and to continue on with my life and I'll be who and what, what it is I want to be. <laughs> Welcome back to Study with the Vest. Now, small businesses are the engine that drive our nation's economy. But what happens when a small business gets stuck in neutral? Well, business owners are shifting gears and getting free advice at LaGuardia Community College. So the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program is a program for businesses, small businesses that have been in business for um, at least two years. They have to have between $150,000 and $4 million in revenue, and they have to have at least two employees. Two lucky employees, since this Goldman Sachs LaGuardia-based program offers outstanding business guidance from Harvard and Wharton Business School professors, and it's free. My name is Daniel Levy. I'm the founder and CEO of ManhattanHomeDesign.com. We are a modern classic furniture company. Like any other business owner, you have an idea and you put it at work and you are tested and you try to, um, um, you know, take it to the best places possible. But I think that there's a point that in, you get a stuck and that's why, you know, people take, call it taking it to the next level. And I think I was in some point stuck and that's when in some point uh, the Goldman Sachs uh, 10,000 small businesses at La Guardia was able to, uh, you know, give me the information, the network, uh, and, 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 and some point show me some of the, the opportunities I could take advantage of. It's been almost three years since Daniel joined the 90-hour program, and it totally upended his professional life. I actually I was fortunate to have two mentors from Goldman Sachs that would actually give me advice in uh, business strategy, accounting, um, maybe other approaches I could give to my business. Then the finance part of the program where uh, I was able to get a loan from CITCO uh, that would make a big difference for us. For Daniel, it was a dream that seriously boosted his bottom line. I think understanding what are your strengths, what could be your weaknesses, and, uh, and, and taking a step back uh, to be more strategic about your business, um, to try to have a vision on maybe on long term, uh, maybe in the next year, next next couple of years. I think that make a, a big difference, and I think that was one of the reasons that we were able to to double sales, to to grow, to create you know jobs. Daniel is just one of many who've entered the prestigious program, and while acceptance into the program is not guaranteed, some entrepreneurs refuse to take no for an answer. I actually enrolled in the program twice. Uh, the first time I was turned down, but I knew that after hearing about the program, this is absolutely something I wanted to do. When I did my first interview, I talked about all the things that were right with my business. When I did my second interview, I talked about the challenges I was facing, how to hire people, um, how to track expenses. It's taught me how to take the limited resources that I have as a small business and apply them where they're gonna do the most good. 
Now, that's something that I know is just going to make my business more profitable down the road and make me more efficient and make me a more successful business. Along with all the priceless expert advice, the entrepreneurs create something else, camaraderie and friendships that endure. You are actually in, in, in a group of other business owners that they have, they share the same challenges, which actually, um, uh, it, it became a huge asset for me, not only because I could learn from the professors, but also from my peers, uh, that sometimes actually I could relate and give them a quick call. I couldn't call the Harvard professor, but I could call my, you know, my, my colleague sitting next to me. And, and in fact, I still, after two years, uh, you know, finishing the program, I still rely on in a lot of their advice and information. And, and actually even, you know, we became friends. The program uses some unusual and fun exercises to promote teamwork and strategy, which has helped to expand thousands of small businesses. Since I've been involved in the program, we've added uh, new services to our school. And actually, we went and focused on growing a, the character aspect to our martial arts program. So we don't just worry about and work with the physical side to teaching our students, but we also worry now and deal with the mental aspect of dealing with our students. So for all these ambitious entrepreneurs, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program at LaGuardia Community College is a win-win situation. And for Daniel Levy, who has since won an award from the U.S. Small Business Administration for his success, Graduation day was just the beginning. I was able to, to receive, you know, my certificate for completion of the classes from, from Warren Buffett. And then next uh, was actually Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Valerie Jarrett, the senior advisor of President Obama. I think for any business owner, if you, if you are thinking big and, and you are like, what, what would be your wildest dream? It, actually, that was, that was for me, you know, becoming true. life story in a musical? Well, four CUNY students did just that by teaming up with a performing arts nonprofit to write, produce, and perform their stories in a musical called Off the Record. I go to Hunter College and I'm studying fine arts. I go to CUNY York. I am a theater major. BMCC. My major is education. I go to Baruch College. Our show is off the record. The Possibility Project is a nonprofit organization, and we bring together groups of teenagers to uh, transform the negative forces in their lives and in their communities into positive action. So we have a year long creative process where uh, groups of young people from all different backgrounds and all five boroughs on different ages come together and they learn through the creative process how to build relationships across cultures, how to resolve the conflicts they face in their lives, uh, how to engage in making a difference in their community and also to lead. And the way in which they do that is by working together to write and then perform an original musical uh, from the stories of their lives focused on the most serious conflicts they face and uh, their ideas for change around those conflicts. The name Off the Record comes from the idea that part of the reason things keep happening is because people won't go on the record with what's going on with them. In my scene, I play an abusive mother. I told you 10 minutes ago dinner was going to be ready in 30 minutes. Why do I always have to repeat myself? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That's because you don't listen. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're sorry, and I'm sorry too. I'm sorry I ever had you. Oh. Ain't nobody the only one. When you're playing your character, it's somebody else in the cast's story. So you have to take it seriously. Nobody abused you. You just can't take being disciplined because you're weak. One of the stories really hit home for me because it applied to my life. And the way that it was told brought tears to my eyes and it made me realize a few things and how to change it. And I wanted to share more. No, no, I think she's okay finding her way around. I mean, she's had like, what, three abortions? Oh. <laughs> She's one cheeseburger away from being obese. I just ended up falling in love with what we were doing and things we were trying to change. And it was different from other acting programs out there because we could relate. Even if it's not directly, 
in some way we could relate to each character that is being played out. It feels better knowing that other people know what you're going through and they can connect in that way. This is, in a way, sort of like therapy. The other thing they do besides doing performances is they do community action projects twice a year where they choose an issue in the community that they care about and they design a project to make a difference on that issue. We're not a go-to-college program, right? It's really about our young people's development, but uh, the net result of all of that is, is that they start to believe in the future a little differently and see the value of going on to school. They help me realize that I have feelings and I have to deal with it to improve myself. It opened up a door for me. I thought that I couldn't trust nobody. And everybody was out to get me. It's really helped me to go up to people, to say hi first, to start conversations, and put myself, you know, ahead of the game. I just want people to come and see it and walk away with something. Thanks for watching Study with the Best. For all things CUNY, log on to our website at cuny.edu or you can Facebook and tweet us at CUNY TV. See you next time. Bye. What I've always said is that uh, I would like to see diplomacy and political action solve international conflicts. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a great nation has to have a great military force that have called upon in the failure of diplomacy to execute battle. Uh, to go after the nation's enemies, uh, we have to be ready for that. And we should do it in a way that is, uh, as I've often said, decisive. I was, I was once asked by, by an Archbishop of Canterbury, why don't you believe more in soft power? I said, I do believe in soft power. But you know, it wasn't soft power that defeated Hitler. It was hard power, because soft power didn't work. And so you want to encourage diplomacy, encourage soft power. But at the end of the day, if hard power is not an option at the end of that, a soft power may not be as effective as it might be.